Ole Anderson has died at the yep. age of 81. Now you've dealt mm-hmm. with Ole over the years. Uh, Alan Robert Rogowski, the real name, one of the top heels of the Territory era, an original member of the Four Horsemen, an owner, a part owner of the Georgia promotion at one time, as well as at one point one of the highest paid and most respected bookers in wrestling. Ole Anderson died at the age of 81. Uh, I also didn't realise that, like you, he was an army veteran. I only found that out today. Uh, he was stationed oh. in Germany prior to his wrestling career. I didn't, I didn't know that either. There you go. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of uh, tweets of tributes. Your old friend Ric Flair has said, I am forever thankful to Ole and Gene for bringing me to Crockett Promotions as a cousin. It launched my career. I will be grateful forever for you giving me the opportunity be- uh, to become who I am today. We didn't always agree with each other, but the honest to God truth is you and Gene started me. Rest in peace, my friend. Ricky Morton said, rest in peace, Ole Anderson. You taught me so much in professional wrestling. You were tough as nails. You'll be missed, my friend. And Tony Schiavone came out with the best one. I am brokenhearted about the death of Ole Anderson. To many, he was a grouchy, cantankerous, non-apologetic, battle-worn son of a bitch. But to me, he was a friend, a mentor, and a man I held in high regard. He taught me a lot about pro wrestling, a lot of which still applies today. I grew up a fan of the Anderson Brothers, but became a bigger fan of Ole the Man after I started in the business. Rest in peace, rock, and make sure to tell someone in the afterlife to go F themselves daily. Yep. Ah. That was his favorite. That's that's his favorite saying. To you? No, to anybody. Go F yourself. You tell everybody that. Ole was one of a kind. And to me, it was hilarious. And he didn't, I think he kind of meant to be funny, but it came across, I laughed at that guy, and he intended for people to laugh anyway, but he was serious. He would say it in such a way that if something went wrong, I think he'd say, oh, I'm just kidding anyway, lighten up, blah, blah, blah. But... And, of course, I've told the story here when he said, I can fire you, I can fire you, and and go on. Uh, But he was a hot, hot heel for a long, long time in the Mid-Atlantic Territory. This is before Atlanta. Him and Gene were hot. I mean, they had heat. I mean... You could see steam coming out of the fans' ears. They were so mad at them. They just they couldn't stand them. Because Ole had a way of doing an interview that you took personal. It's like he's talking directly to you or your family. And you and you, and that's the kind of heel that's worth gold. Because the people they said, I hate that son of a and people did hate him. They hated him so bad. I've talked about the night in Greenville, South Carolina, when he walked out, the guy cut him 76 st- stitches and he cut him from like right here down to the belt line. He went like, and cut him. I think with a hawk bill, you know what a hawk bill is? No, it's, a, it's got a hook on it or something. Or... It's got a hook on yeah. it. So when it goes, it's hooking and you will hold that meat all the way down. 76 stitches by the time they got through with it. And and then Ole made a made a joke about it later. Said they were looking for an old guy who looks like he has dementia. And then Ole says, and 30 minutes later they arrested Gene. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was his joke. But and he probably he came back to work after about a week, I think, not in the ring, but he was there, showed me, showed me the stitches, and, oh, they looked, not, he still bandaged up, but it, it looked bad. And Ole, if you, and he was a cantankerous, malcontent, racist bastard. But there was something about him that made you like him. Even he could be cussing you out, but cussing you out in a way that you felt like, well, if he just calms down, he'll be okay. Because he would go into rants. And when he'd go into rants, it was it was a performance. And when he would go into a rant, I would just sit down, because I didn't have a cigar then, but if I did, 
I would just sit down and enjoy the rant and nobody else would say nothing to him. And he would have this whole fit, a conniption fit, I call it. He would have it all by himself, entertaining as hell. I wish I'd have got it on tape. And and he would bring, whoever was in his line of sight, they would be brought into it. And he would be talking. See, he was talking about Tony Schiavone. That Tony Schiavone, that stupid son of a bitch, blah, 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 blah. Then he's talking about somebody. Then he'd talk about Jim Hurd. Then he'd talk about damn Barnett. And then who? Then he'd look at me, Dutch, Dutch Maldi. He'd bring everybody in it. So anybody who was bothering him at the time, or he just happened to bounce on or see, they would come into the conversation. And then he'd just stop. Then he'd go on and go do something else. He was unpredictable as hell. But I liked Ole, and his health hasn't been good. And my condolences to his family. And I don't know if he was still married or whatever. I saw him at some signings. But I don't know how. Did he have dementia to at the end a little bit? Lord, do you know, as embarrassing as it is, I didn't even write down what he died of. I'm not sure that's been released. I can try and find out. But, yeah, he, he seems to have ill health for many years. Was he in a wheelchair for goodness yeah. knows how long? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I remember him in the days. He was the... He was almost the epitome of the of the classic heel that you just hated. Because, you know, for Gene to get that much heat, Gene couldn't talk his way out of a traffic ticket. I mean, Gene is very soft-spoken, and he doesn't talk a lot. So Ole was his, was his great counterpart that did the talking for both of them. Of course, the famous angle. Are we going to talk about that later? We'll talk about that later, yes. Um, we actually had a lot of fan questions coming. I'm sorry, I'm about to have a pill. Um, to people who don't like him, Ollie was nothing more than a bitter, ignorant, sarcastic, cantankerous, bullying, racist, disrespectful, stuck in the early 90s and 1970s, malcontent. And to the people who liked him would pretty much say the same thing, it yeah. seems. But, um, what was it? Hmm. But, uh, but I liked mm -hmm. Ollie because... Only like me, because he would go in these rants because he saw that I enjoyed him a little bit. So he would come up and start going into a rant right in front of me, and I'd just look at him, and it looked like I wanted to laugh, but I didn't, but he could tell I wanted to. So he knew he was getting to me and entertaining me, and he enjoyed that. So, And I think if Ole had fired me and I went up to him, I said, Ole, don't, don't do that, please. And he'd hire me back. <laughs> that was the kind of relationship. I may be totally wrong, but I think if he had fired me, I think I could go and talk to him, even if he was really mad. I think I could go and talk to him, and he'd reverse the decision. He said, I'll make you bookings and shut up and stay out of my way. <laughs> Something like that. He'd get the last word in, but he, he, he was the boss. Now, uh, we've got a lot of fan questions coming in for Oli. So, uh, first one, Hassan Malik, what was your first impression of Oli Anderson? And more specifically, I'll add this in, when was the first time you met him? Was this during the Angunkle Georgia Wars or was this later on? No, I, it was later on. I knew of him and I saw him when I was growing up because he was good from day one. I mean, you noticed him because I was a fan but when he come on TV and I heard that interview, I immediately says, this guy, it, I didn't know what I was talking about, but this guy is noticeable. You know this guy's around. And he did some classic, classic interviews, even before I knew the whole score. But I noticed him and they had heat. They had... And because I would talk to wrestling fans, oh, I hate that Ole Anderson. I hate those Andersons. And he was a godsend for uh, Gene and for Lars. See, actually, out of the, did I like Ole? I liked uh, Ole. I didn't like Lars. Lars was a smart ass I couldn't stand. I ended up getting the fight with him. I, I told you about that. But Ole, I never come close to having even worse to. And Gene never talked. Gene, they was like, Lars didn't say a lot, and Ole did. 
Gene didn't say nothing and only said everything. So, and when Gene came along, that was the end of Lars. Because I don't think you could get heat with Lars if you doused him with gasoline and threw a match on him. I think it was the other way around. So I think Ole replaced Lars. Because it was Gene and yeah, Lars Ole, first. And oh, then, yes, yeah. Ole, Ole replaced Lars. That's right. Um, let me ask this one. Uh, Mark, oh dear it, Mark, Mark Kuschester. That's weird. Uh, oh, sorry, Marcus Hester. I'm sorry. I just All these letters run together in these usernames. Was Ole ever nice? Did he ever smile? And what made him laugh? Oh, it, he laughed all the time in the dressing room. But you would never see him like break a smile. You know, he would laugh. <laughs> well, he'd laugh it with was a like frown. That. Like, oh, oh, yeah, oh. it was. <laughs> and he was he was like in a mood every night. You just didn't know what it was, you know. But I've seen him. You know, I could guys could make him laugh, but he would laugh. But he would laugh at his own stuff. Only is hard to describe, but you know when he was when he was when he was pissed, you knew it. Now, when he was pissed working, you kind of knew that too. So, but yeah, he he laughed at jokes and he he would kid around. Uh, Andrew Machado was asked, "Was there anybody that Ole Anderson actually liked?" R.I.P. Ole. So, who was who were Ole's favorites back in the day? Well, he liked the ones that could make him money. I think he personally, I don't think he liked wrestling too, but he knew he had to deal with him. So he got along with him and he's been called a racist, but who he liked a lot was Thunderboat Patterson. And he made a lot of money with Thunderboat. Because he got Thunderboat hot uh, in Georgia and he, he pushed him like a, he pushed him like a son of a gun. You ever heard one of Thunderboat's commercial uh, interviews? Yeah, great talker. He didn't say nothing. He was like, no, I just want to say. God, he had so much charisma, though. Yeah, and he sounded like a, a, a black yeah. Georgia holiness preacher. If you move. <laughs> if you move. If the uh, yeah, that's all he would say. It's great. And he, and he had that one eye. Is I don't know what happened to that, but he drew someone moved. <laughs> yeah, he 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 drew a ton of money, and Ole saw that this guy is marketable and pushed him like a son of a gun. And he was Thunderbolt was was the Black Dusty because it wasn't his work. Damn sure it wasn't his work. Even with Dusty, it wasn't his work. It was his interview because you liked him. And you felt like, like you said, you felt like you were being preached to. And if you move, oh, Lord. <laughs> and it was good. It really was. It was. It's funny that you mentioned preaching. Tony Atlas, when I interviewed him, told me a story. And he said he got into it, Thunderbolt, with, with some other wrestler. I can't remember. Uh, might have had the name Tank in it or something. Um, <clears throat> Thunderbolt knocked him spark out and then he got over his body took out his bible and started quoting bible verses at his unconscious body so I, was like, I, I believe that I'd, I would believe that yeah. I, wrestling's a weird hey, person sometimes man. A weird I mean there's there's no telling <laughs> I, and I didn't even know Thunderbolt that well so imagine if I'd known him well some of the things he would have told me, some of the things he would have done, some of the things he could have, you know, just described. I'm kind of, of the things I missed in wrestling, knowing Thunderbolt a little better is one of them. Uh, next question is John Alunil, I believe. Uh, is there an instance where you saw Ole do a very nice act for someone that revealed that he wasn't just a mean old ogre? Like so many shoot interviews claim him to be. I have a hard time believing that Ole was mean and angry all the time and didn't have any compassion for anyone like so many wrestlers claim Ole was in shoot interviews. So do you remember Ole really going out of his way to do something nice for someone for the sake of being nice? No. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I never have. <laughs> let's, uh, 
No, we've talked about the race. So your first memories of Oli was with Gene, then I take it. Just watching as a fan. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I take it you don't remember him when he was Al the Rock Rogowski. Was no. that just an AWA thing? Yeah, I don't think he came south with that. No. Uh, Oli replaced your friend Lars Anderson, who you best remember uh, for stories uh, that you've told about him and getting a fight with him in the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Uh You've you, you alluded to it before, but just Oli and Gene as a team, what did they mean to wrestling and how good were they? I think you even nominated them for when I asked you as a Mount Rushmore of the greatest tag teams of all time. I think you said Oli and Gene as one of them. Well, they wouldn't be out of place on that. The Hall of Fame of wrestling tag teams, they wouldn't be out of place. I think one of the and and they they wrestled. And they use the old style, and I never even heard a even a commentator bring this up. But if but if you noticed the great tag teams back when I started out, they had a they had a theory, or you know a, a match plan to keep your opponents in your half of the ring, and like from corner to say you had this post and this post, your opponents and you. Well, the other post, that's where you try to keep your opponents. And it's just a talking point, really. That's all it is. But it, if you think about it, it made sense. Keep your opponent in your half of the ring to where, you know, you're closer to him than his, uh, than his partner is. Which you, if you had a announcer bring that up, it makes sense. So I noticed that about them. I noticed that also about the assassins, but they had a, uh, they worked on story more than anything else, but they didn't have any fantastic spots they did or anything else. It would just beat your ass wrestling in Oli's interviews. And that's what they went on for years. And they could do that because he drew money. They drew money. And then they would change the, they kept the Andersons together, but they would change the teams mm. that they went against. Of course, that's wrestling anyway, but they would change the, the teams up, the makeup of it, you know, and, and when they got uh, steamboat there and he teamed up with a, another young baby face, they still sold out. They still had a ton of heat because at one time at Charlotte territory, you, he couldn't have gotten any hot, hotter. Because they were selling out. When you sell out Greensboro Coliseum, 21,000 seats, that's a Madison Square Garden thing. But when you go to Greensboro, North Carolina, and you sell it out, that means you're drawing from South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Baltimore, Kentucky. You're drawing anywhere that that TV goes into, and people would make the trips to Greensboro to go to that show. Now, <clears throat> uh, I had a couple more questions that we're actually going to skip. How's my mustache look today? Very symmetrical. Very good. Very good. Stands out Thank well. You. Stand, standing Thank out you. well. Thank you. Uh, show Ryu Ken says, did Dutch witness any interactions between Oli and Jim Hurd during WCW in the early 90s? And if so, what was the dynamic between the two men? And did Oli ever share his opinion of Hurd with Dutch at the time? I think Oli shared his opinion of Hurd to almost anybody <laughs> with this. <laughs> Because he thought Hurd was not a wrestling guy. He was a pizza guy who got put in a position that he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know promotion. He, he knew anchovies and olives, I guess. As he knew the pizza business. But he didn't know how to deal with wrestlers. He didn't know how to deal with personalities. He needed to, he, he knew how to deal with a customer who wasn't happy with their anchovy pizza. He knew how to do that. But for a wrestler, here's, a, here's my Jim Hurd story. I had a job with them, and I forgot how I got the job. I think through, through Oli. And then Oli left, and I didn't hear anything from him. So I called him up and I kept calling her and calling her and calling her. And somebody said, well, you need to sue him. I said, for what? He said, we're not bringing you in. I said, that's my word against them. They said, well, try it. 
So I went to this lawyer, this damn, just on the street lawyer. I paid him like 50 bucks. I said, this is the deal. And I said, listen, they offered to bring me in on this date. I give like 10th of June and the date coming. I didn't hear anything from them. Tell them that uh, unless they bring me in, I'm suing the company. It's a threat. I didn't know what to sue them about. And, and I sent it certified mail, which makes it look official, I guess. Because when he gets certified mail, he has to sign for it, which means he got it. A couple of days later, after he got the letter, I, I got a call from his secretary. <laughs> and her and I, and I got to be friends with her later. I forgot her name. And she said, hi, Dutch. This is so-and-so. I'm Jim Hurd's, uh, you know, secretary. Okay. And Jim Hurd wanted me to call you and tell you that you you start. My dog's going to bark. All right. I thought Jim Hurd walked in. You look yeah, at that was, Yeah, that's Jim Hurd. Sorry, we can oh, barely no. hear him. You carry on. Okay. But anyway. She called me, hi, Dutch, this is so-and-so. I'm the secretary of Jim Hurd. And he wanted me to tell you that they want you to start <laughs> uh, some June 21st in Columbus, Georgia, or wherever it was. So I went to work down there. I had to, had to threaten to sue him, but I got a job, and it worked for two years. So... But one of the good things out of getting hired down there is one day, Ole come up to me. He said, come here, you son of a bitch. <laughs> That's like saying, come here, my friend. I mean, you, you want a job? I said, well, what? Other than what you're doing now? Yeah. He said, I want you to commentate the show with Shabani. And do what? Commentate. You know what? <laughs> you know what that means? I went, well, yeah. He said, you start next week. Okay. So the next week, I'm, I'm out there with Shivani, and I stayed there the whole time. So me and Shivani out there commentating over the, I think, a worldwide show. I forgot. They had two. Yeah, there's, One syndicate. Yeah, there's, it was worldwide. There was like Pro for a while and WCW. No, yeah, I think it was the worldwide show, I yeah. think. And it was me and Shivani for, for two years. And that's, that's how I got to know really Tony. Tony's funny as hell, too. We need to have Tony on at one point. Um, I'll I'll try and put a call in for that. Uh, a few more fan questions. We'll close it down. Jason Bink, Dutch, how did Ole change from 1980 to 1990? I hear stories of how old school he was, so it's odd to me that he would even consider voicing the Shockmaster. Also, uh, did he do any booking in the 1990s? And if so, what do you think of his methods? So uh, first question here is, how did Ole change from 1980 to 1990? I don't know what that question is. I don't know how to answer oh, that. Oh, per personality-wise, when you met him in 1980 and then when you knew him in 1990, did he change in those 10 years? Not really. He was still, even when I, after he got hurt, whatever happened to Ole, you know, he's been having bad health. And But I saw him probably in the mid, mid-90s, and we made this show – somewhere in God knows where Georgia and it was a show and a, like a, like a signing and he was there and they had about 150 people at this show, 200 maybe. And I told the guy what I do the show for and he sent me half of it up front. But then at the end of the show, guess what? He didn't have enough money to pay everybody, and they were going to kill him. They actually drug him into the shower and said they're going to beat the crap out of him unless he comes up with the money. And I remember Arn was there, uh, some mass guy. Uh, the I Patriot, Del Wilkes. I the you Patriot yeah, yeah. was there, somebody else. And they had to call the police out. They took him down to the, to, to the station to, for protection. But I, I, but I wasn't with them because I'd got half my money, so I was halfway protected. So I just went home. I said, "You do what you want to do." 
And they said, why are you leaving? I said, well, I got half my money. Well, why didn't we get half of ours? I said, I don't know. Maybe you didn't ask for it. I don't know why you didn't get it. I'm, I'm not in charge of that. But uh, I don't know if Ole was part of that. But he seemed the same. How did you describe him? Cantankerous, mm -hmm. irritable, malcontent, something else. Can't Don't get along man, with anybody. Yeah. Disagreeable. He was the same way. He sat down there and he, he signed pictures. He wasn't on the show. He would just, it's, it's a signing where you come and they have pictures of themselves. You know, people have been to signing. They know what I'm talking about. And, uh, he was the same way. He would argue with the people who would come up and buy his stuff. That was that was Oli. And I went down there and said hello to him. And he kind of remembered me, and then he kind of didn't. So that's, I would rather – and the reason I didn't talk to him more is because I wanted to remember him as he was and not how he is when I met him hmm. or not, not how he was when I, when I met him after 10, 12 years. I think we've got maybe two more. Um, very quickly, Stone Tank says, what are your thoughts of the short-lived Ole Anderson-Tim Horner alliance after he got kicked out of the Horsemen? Such an odd pairing. No kidding. <laughs> Won't you team up Ole and damned, uh, who's that piano player that was famous? Michael. Beethoven. Who? Yeah, Beethoven. <laughs> Not, that'd be the same deal. Oh, you that's, mean the maestro? The wrestling guy. <laughs> yeah, the maestro. Teaming them up, it didn't I, – I don't know. Uh, it, it was only. So anybody that saw it, you, you don't got it. I think he liked Tim a little bit. You ever meet Tim? Never spoke to him, no. Yeah, nice guy. He just – even just uh, – East Tennessee is – Talks that way and everything. You ever heard him do an interview? I, I yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. He said, "Well, let me tell you, I'm gonna come there and to that town, and yell, I'm gonna get in the ring, and yell, so and so, whoever he's wrestling, and I'm gonna show you that you can't treat people that way, and it's in so and so town, <laughs> and I'm gonna come there." <laughs> And I'm getting the ring, and he says he he does the interview twice. So talking wasn't his wasn't his strong point, but and only teaming up with him, I never made. I never knew what to think of that, and it was an odd odd pairing. Yes, it was. Uh, to finish this off, because we're going to go on to Smoky Mountain Wrestling with Tim Horner, who is probably most famous for Smoky Mountain, and uh, among other things, is. Uh, Oli voiced the Black Scorpion, rumored to be a pitch by Oli to Jim Hurd as a joke that went out of uh, control. And he also voiced the Shotmaster, as mentioned before. But then the story of how he got fired from WCW. Eric Bischoff fired Bryant Anderson, which was Oli's son. Yep. And then Oli tried to get Bryant a job with Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And Bischoff mm -hmm. hated Cornette so badly at the time that uh, Bischoff fired Oli over it. So you were with Smoky Mountain at the time. Do you remember the, the brouhaha with this happening? I remember it, but did Bryant ever make it to Smoky Mountain? Uh, I'd have to check. I don't remember ever seeing a match with him. I don't think he made it either, to tell you the truth. But see, that goes back to prof professional jealousy. This was all, and Heard was still there, right? No, this Hurt. is when this is when Eric Bischoff had taken over in ninety three. Well, Bischoff. So he hated Cornette. Mm -hmm. And why did he hate Cornette so bad? I don't know, because Cornette had a relationship with Bill Watts, which saw Cornette go to WCW with a couple of um cross promotion things with the Heavenly Bodies and such, and then Bischoff took over Bischoff in now, some hating, ways. Now hating Cornette is not an an unheard of experience. No. There's a lot of guys that don't like Jimmy because Jimmy, he just like a, he, if, he, if he didn't like you, he would, he would have no, no qualms about telling you that you're just a no good piece of crap. And I think that's probably why all, him and Ole got along because their techniques were similar. 
So about uh, uh, Bischoff firing Ole, uh, I think Ole was at the end of the end of the the run anyway, mm-hmm. and I don't think Ole liked Bischoff being the one to tell him. That was what it was. To answer your question, Brian Anderson would do some matches in WCW up to 94, and then he would appear in Smoky Mountain Wrestling from uh, October 1994. So I suspect you'd left by this point. But he I would don't. Actually... I, was in, yeah. I was in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Uh, you. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Brian was there until the beginning of 1995. So to answer your question, yes, uh, Brian was there for a brief period. And I got Brian confused with Brad in my mind because Brad was in WCW. He was Gene's son, and he wrestled as the masked pink bidet Zan Panzer. Uh, and I think you teamed with him or wrestled him at one point, even though I think I've asked you this, you didn't even remember. I don't remember. No, I, I really don't, because you have so many matches, really against so many people in so many towns, because it all blurs together, because somebody says, well, what does so-and-so town look like? I see it from a ring with a ring light over it and people out there. Maybe. Maybe yeah. some people out there. Maybe no people. Maybe some empty chairs. I, was, yeah. I have wrestled. I, I've been in some towns that the whole section would be empty. And I said, damn, who? I think a marble shoot would have would have drawn more people. They had to. They didn't. It tells me they didn't promote it at all. Just pro wrestling will draw you at least a hundred people. Anyway, if you promote it halfway right, if you got a good card, you might draw five, six hundred, according to what you got to pay for. And that that's how much money you make. If you don't have a big payday, uh, a payroll, you, know, you make a little money. 